Hello, hello to all. Hello, good morning. Welcome to episode number 13 of Eat NATO for Breakfast. I'm Franziska. I'm speaking to you from Berlin. Um, hello and good morning. Today we're going to talk about the concept of security. Security, that thing that NATO is actually promising all of us. But what is it? Security is one of those complicated words like democracy, freedom, or even peace that can mean almost anything. And for example, we know when NATO talks about bringing peace, what they mean is war. And what is it when they talk about security? What does NATO mean when they talk about defending our security, securing our security, armed to the teeth being a threat to everyone else? Is that what is going to make us secure? And what does it mean when the other side, when peace movements, when social movements, when justice movements talk about peace? What do they mean? What do they mean when they talk about security? What do they want to what do they want to achieve? What does our idea, a people's idea of security actually look like? So we have two experts on the topic. We are very, very happy um, to have Katarina uh, Anastasiu from the Transform Europe. Um, this is a network of 39 European foundations and research institutions. And we have Axel with us, Axel Rupert, from the Brussels office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. They have been actually working precisely on this topic, thinking and talking about the need for a new concept of security, one that doesn't isn't based on a military threat model um, and needs actually more meeting the needs of the people. Um, and one that is, of course, based on a more peaceful notion of what security could be. Hi, Kat. Hi, Axel. It's so nice to have you both here. Um, what are you having for breakfast? That's our general morning questions. I'm doing my thing with my cup, with my coffee. Um, and how are you feeling today? Secure in your, in your homes, in your places of work, wherever you're at? How are you doing, guys? Hello, Francisca. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I mean, right now, I definitely don't feel secure in my home because my neighbors are changing their windows, so I'm kind of scared the ceiling is going to fall on my head. I hope you don't hear that as well. Um, thank you for inviting us today. But aside of the joke, I mean, I haven't felt personally secure and safe for many years. Um, the world we live in is kind of crazy. The environment is about to collapse. Nobody pays attention to the scientists and the IPCP report. Uh, all of a sudden, since two months and due to the war in Ukraine, everybody's talking about the nuclear threat again. So no, I don't really feel secure. I mean, it also takes a walk to the supermarket and the price is rising, um, basic foods, or if you get your electricity um, you know, bill these days, you don't really feel safe. So yeah, thank you for having us today. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, I'm in Brussels, so I'm having uh, a pain au chocolat. Um, it's a nice uh, chocolate-filled uh, croissant-like, um, sweet, uh, delicious uh, things you can you can get here in Brussels. I can recommend it to everybody whenever you're in Brussels. Uh, it's a great breakfast. Um, feeling secure right now where I am regarding my, my material security, so how my basic needs are covered um, and how I can be here right now. I feel, um, I feel quite safe and I think this is also connected and also touch upon that later on. Um, security is, is very much related to also to privileges and, and as a white man uh, living in Brussels, um, I, feel, I feel more or less safe in the city and can, can uh, also feel safe in the, in the public space. Um, which is very different for, for other people living in the very same city. So I think this is, um, for me, important um, always to, to realize that our, our security differs uh, very much, um, even though we're living close uh, to each other. So that is one hand, my, my material security at the very moment. And then there is the other aspect that's around in my head, and that is um, the the really the existential threats we're facing and they make me feel insecure and that's uh, ecological breakdown um the increasing um, climate crisis and uh, the threat of nuclear destruction and now with uh, the war in ukraine um that has come closer and what we see right now is also a shift to military answers to armament um away from uh, focusing um on health issues on care issues on climate issues um, and that is very worrying because we have seen, can't mention it, uh, the IPCC report that really showed that we have 
um, a closing window um, and we need to act decisively now, but now attention is shifting away. And I think this is at the moment very worrying and um, that's what I, uh, what I really feel insecure about. That's, we've already packed into the first two minutes, um, I believe topics for about 14 hours of conversation and really important, uh, important stuff. Uh, Nora, how are you doing? Yeah, I will be on the same thread than Axel and Katerina. I don't feel very secure today. I just read in the paper that Spain is going to spend more than 37 million of euros on the NATO summit of June in Madrid. 20 million on rent, 1 million for meals, and they are buying more than 6,000 cartridges for laser electric pistols. Those are a lot of tasers. I don't know against who are they going to use them. I hope it's not me. Um, this is an example on how in the name of security our lives become more insecure as vital resources like those 37 millions could be allocated into green transition, healthcare and public housing. I hope that we can talk of all of these today with all of you. But before we start, I think it's the perfect moment to promote the poster call we are organizing at the Peace Summit. It's called, in fact, Insecurity Poster Call. It's a discussion between peace and war in our daily lives and deals, in fact, with the issues that we are going to be discussing today with Kat and Axel, and maybe some ideas can pop up into your mind. For you to know, you can make a poster about something that makes you feel insecure and another, if you want to send to us too, with what you think that makes you feel secure. And in fact, there is a special section on the call about feminist security and insecurity that is done in collaboration with our sisters from Capite. So we welcome you, we welcome you all to cultivate a practice and spirit of internationalism by creating solidarity art in service of the people's movements and struggle against the war and for peace. You have till June 1st to send your posters, so we'll paste the link uh, with all the info on the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Nora. That's really good. That's a very good reminder. And I know that already posters have come in, so this is actually exciting too. And we will hopefully get to see all of those in Madrid when we all come together to the uh, Peace Summit. All right, but let's start. Um, last year, uh, Kat and Axel, you produced a paper called Security and the Left in Europe and made like a number of workshops with delegates from social movements. And Nora is showing it, so there you go, please. There's the, um, we will also put the link in the chat because it is, of course, also available online. Um, so with a lot of social movements and organizations that send delegates, you did workshops, uh, very, a lot of practical work around, you know, what is, what is a people-centered security. At the time when the workshops happened, that was, um, in the sort of still in the middle, more or less, of the pandemic, there was a lot of reflection on uh, on the consequences of COVID, where it suddenly where it suddenly seemed there seemed to be an opening, understanding what is essential, what are essential human needs, what do the people really need. Suddenly, there was more conversation around healthcare, sudden like access to you know healthcare for everyone. Um, there were there were these crises of people losing their jobs. Um, the rise in violence towards, like domestic violence, especially towards women um, during the lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there were, you know, sick relatives we couldn't visit. The lockdown in and of itself became like something essential to people to talk about. So there was a lot of conversation around this. Um, access to vaccines, a certain amount of solidarity, like a global, the idea that we are globally connected and need to take care of each other became somewhat apparent for a moment and then we re then with the beginning of the ukraine war we are finding ourselves suddenly in a situation where apparently um the concept of security is based entirely on weapons and on armaments and on increased military spending and suddenly our security seems to be you know peace is best assured by sending weapons to ukraine is currently sort of the slogan and it doesn't take a nine-year-old that's what my daughter found very confusing to figure out that this is in and of itself so illogical that it's not even you can't wrap your head around it so what does it mean how did we shift so quickly how does it how does it happen that we shift so quickly from the essential needs of human beings 
to such a militarized um, process in there? And is that really, like, that is NATO's role, to distract us from our real needs or to distract us into thinking, you know, security can only be achieved through military spending. So I would like you to reflect a little bit on how, you know, how where you were at when you proposed the paper, when you wrote the paper, what your hopes and ideas were, and how this has now been impacted or derailed to some extent uh, by the current situation. Maybe we'll let Kat speak first for a little bit, and then uh, Axel, you can also um, react to this, if that's cool. Go. Thank you, Francisca, for the question. Um, I hope you can hear me correctly. So listen, I mean, first of all, um, the first thing I have to say is that nothing has really shifted in the narration of the NATO. I mean, um, let me start by saying that, that the, a real concept of non-antagonistic, non-militaristic security based on the principles of mutual respect and solidarity and aiming at a lasting peace globally has never been hegemonial, if we're honest. Um, the response of the so-called West and the EU in, the particular, uh, in particular, for example, in every crisis situation of the last, I don't know, 20 years, taking it now from my generational aspect and the time I've been politically active, has always been more military, more surveillance, less rights, more police, uh, more border control. The process of the militarization of the European Union um, and uh, the NATO states per se, and the US in particular, has been ongoing for years. Wars have been waged in several regions of the world, and in fact, uh, part of the war waged by Russia in Ukraine, uh, which is of course to be condemned, there are other wars happening all around the world that are not reported enough. And uh, many, most of this, in most of these wars, people really have to face their consequences, like children dying from hunger and thirst in Yemen, or look at the, the crisis now in Afghanistan. What has indeed uh, changed um, in this situation is that due to the proximity of this war to the European Union, it is easier for those in power to advocate for more weapons, more militarized security, uh, more war monitoring. So I would like to elaborate on that a little bit. For example, during the time you described, the time Axel and I have been spending on discussing security uh, with social movements and, and, and this, different aspects of, of struggle. The European Commission and the European Parliament, they have different research services that do regular risk assessments um, um, of the European Union. So to say it boldly, what would be a typical risk situation for the European, also before COVID. Uh, a typical, in this kind of listing uh, during this risk assessment, a typical risk factor for the European Union would be migration, would be listed as migration. So if you would read through this document, you will see that agencies like Frontex, border control agencies, or even the European army would be placed, um, like positioned in this concept as a guarantor of European security. But what these concepts never do is asking whose security are we talking about and what is the actual security risk. Um, as I said before, um, there is a very real danger of environmental uh, non-reversible collapse. And um, it is not um, a future scenario we will have to deal with. Actually, our generation of us four talking today, uh, we're most definitely in the next, uh, in the next we will not have a nice and peaceful uh, pension time. Rather, um, if we continue like this, being uh, in a in a very antagonistic environment where real um, resources wars will be waged everywhere. So it's it um, if we if we consider uh, who, um, again the question whose security are we talking about? It is pretty clear that um, 
as leftists and Marxists, our priority is the security of everyone, the security of the workers and the people. And when security is discussed behind closed doors in Brussels, we're talking about the security of capital and the security of profits. So um, this is something that needs to be untangled and in fact hasn't changed uh, through the war in Russia. What, what has happened is a, a change in the media landscape and how war is communicated. Because until now it was something happening far away Way, you know, the European narration going, oh, they're all so uncivilized and they have war and we have nothing to do with it. And right now, having the war so close to the European border kind of enables them to advocate for more weaponization, more militarization, more um, expenditure for war, which of course creates profits for very few people. And there's enough research of that showing that they're entangled with another. And this is uh, the last point I would like to make because I think there is this kind of distortion of how war is communicated right now and the actual needs of people in Europe where I'm based, I'm based in Vienna. The last uh, barometer poll um, showed that 85% of the European population actually advocate peace. So there is an indeed a discrepancy between um, the actions of European leaders and what actually people of Europe want. And let me just stop here. Um, Yeah, I'll just continue, I guess. Um, I think, yeah, as you said, the the attention really shifted, um, and I think this is this is due to the to the urgency of the situation. And and I think when we've been looking at the pandemic and when we're looking at the war right now, I think the the core issue um, that we that we should think about is how do states uh, react. Um, to pandemics um, and um, to wars, and whose security do they have in mind? Um, and I think this is really this is really fundamental, and also our our approach to discuss security um, from the left to to question how governments react. What tools do they choose to use to protect whom from what? And um, the discussion has been focusing on the on the security of the state. Um, and on national security for decades, and was hegemonized by by the political right, um, as 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 Kat explained, we never had the uh, hegemony for for really um, a, a peace based uh, security approach. Um, so during the pandemic, um, there was the attention for the public health crisis, but how did states react? And Francisco, what you outlined, I think I, th I think that played out mostly among among people and social movements. But not necessarily. Um, we haven't seen that in in, in, in states' reactions. And also, some uh, heads of states were choosing war rhetoric to to the pandemic, um, declaring a war against the virus. Um, so also here, falling back into this this like, security discourse, then even answering a pandemic with war rhetorics and and this kind of logic. And what we see during the pandemic is that capital interests were protected. Um, schools were closing down, but not factories. People were still um, sent to offices um, while, while kids had to stay at home um, and, and do homeschooling. And we were really um, taking, taking severe measures uh, in our personal lives. Um, at the same time, the, the precarious situation in the care sector was very, very, very in the open. Um, but the care sector was not fundamentally reformed um, in in European states um, and bettered and working conditions bettered. There were subsidies for corporations to get through um, the pandemic, but most, most of the times these were not tied to conditions. Um, and now in, in, uh, in the case of the, of the Kremlin's war being, being, being raged in, uh, in Ukraine, um, as a response, we see investment um, into armament and, for example, not investment um, in sustainable energy, into the energy transition um, to uh, insulate people's homes, um, to create energy autonomy, to get um, rid of the fossil fuel dependency. Um, we also don't see um, things like property registered introduced that clearly shows who owns um, what kind of property. Um, and that would be an important um, part of targeted sanctions on, on Russian oligarchs and millionaires who are stabilizing the Putin regime. We also don't see that because such a property register also hurts the interest of the capital class in Western Europe. 
And we also see that diplomacy, diplomatic efforts, diplomacy, especially towards China and India, are, um, are, are neglected as well. And it's very much focused on, on military answers and um, investments into armament. So I think the reactions that we've, that we've seen are to some extent similar. And I think we have reason to be skeptical uh, about the kinds of answers that our power structures um, will produce also in the future. And I think this is, this is then the core thing uh, to focus on. Um, for whom is what kind of security um, provided? And I think this will, this will stay for us for the, um, for, the next, uh, for the next years to come. Um, and we will again. We will see a shift of attention um, to other um, other crises that we're going to face. And then I think the same question will be there: um, How will social movements be able um, to claim the security of the many um, instead of uh, protecting the security of the few? Yeah, I think like uh, Axel, you just like diving in in our next question. Uh, you've been like framing. Uh, the answers uh, from power structures and the shifts that happens. And now we want to um, ask Kat uh, the answers from the left perspective and the alternatives from the social movements. So um, like on your paper, you were pointing out this necessity of uh, rethinking security um, in a way that uh, points us uh, the peace movement and the left and progressive forces, like that we have a lack of a common strategy concept of security. That is not only an idea, it's not only a concept, but uh, something that is not ambiguous, that is concrete, that has um, a strategy, right? So it's like uh, we need to address these issues, uh, also pointing out uh, those roots uh, that causes the insecurity uh, to the people. Uh, on the way that you were uh, answered before. So what are those roots uh, of insecurity and how is security debated among social movements, peace movements and left organizations? Thank you very much, Nora. So, okay, I just, I guess now what, what I need to do is not explain why people feel insecure when they, when they have to live, you know, paycheck to paycheck, but rather I will try to elaborate at first why capitalism needs insecurity while leveraging security to steal from us. This would be the very easy way to explain this argument. We need to understand that in order for capitalism to function, there is a need for constant insecurity. You all of us have heard about markets and production change that are regulated by invisible hands. You know, nobody knows about investors being flocked from market to market, uh, making gains out of thin air. So this kind of insecurity, meaning, um, let's say something like a golden rule that it is impossible to live in a just a world and per se uh, life uh, by them is connected to a constant insecurity and struggle of survivor is actually a very in the very core of the project uh, of of the of their concept of governing the world and what actually instead makes us weak um this insecurity brings profits for the few and the paradox uh, we have to deal with strategically and in cooperation between movements is that these very people creating insecurity for everybody else, no matter in one con what continent now, are the ones that sell us security in form of more surveillance, more violence, more military, uh, less freedom. So taking it now, I, I will try to break it down a little bit from let's say social movement to social movement. Let's start with the feminist movement. I mean, for every woman uh, in the world, um, everyday life is less safe in practical terms, in material terms, than it is for a man. This is something that I also thank Axel that 
that he's critical about his position as well. We have feminicides happening. We have sexualized violence. We have discrimination at the working place or not even access to a working space or education. And in general, women are taught they have to feel, be fearful in every aspect of their life. And this is kind of what the, the patriarchal state of mind tells us is this is the natural way of things. You will feel insecure and there will be a big man to protect you. On the side of the feminist movement, now what they're saying is no, we are entitled to safety. We are entitled to security and we're going to get that ourselves. And actually what causes us insecurity is this indiscrepancy of rights and roles in, within the society. So we're going to deal with that. Um, I hope this was a little bit clear. Then I'll, let me jump back to the ecological movement. I mean, we, until recently, actually, I think that uh, in, in terms of this war in the Ukraine, something is changing to the positive. But until recently, a lot of um, arguments made in the public debate by um, eco-activists were, were very concentrated on uh, individualistic uh, consummation patterns and, uh, you know, um, uh, niche problems, so to say. But um, as we know, since the Kyoto Protocol was uh, first uh, ratified, uh, the emissions of military or the, the environmental destruction of war or the fact that um, resources that are used for war or war monitoring uh, or this kind of deterrent security systems were used of, um, all, all these funds actually cost uh, to the environment and our protection as well. So if you are, um, if you want, um, a future that uh, is in uh, in balance with our environment and our planet that is sustainable that is um that is not um, ex um extractivist and uh, and capitalist then you really have to tackle uh the weapon industry as a problem when you're engaged in an ecological movement and in the anti-racist movement it's the same i mean um uh, the anti-racist movement has, be, has been very active in Europe um, for many, many years. At first, me, myself, being part of that, we were trying to stop Dublin. Then Dublin happened. Then 2015 happened. Then we were trying to stop the far right, helping refugees, being solidarity uh, in solidarity with refugees. But in many of these movements, the, the topic of peace or the demand to stop engaging into wars was there, but not prominently. So... Um, and and you see that the, the the ones in charge taking, for example, Frontex, um, but also the, the the governments of the external borders of the European Union actually use that use the fact that um, we we never address security because all of a sudden people were told there, there should be more scared of somebody coming from Syria with nothing than the very capitalist super rich men that are taking decisions on our behalf, making millions and wasting our planet. So um, what we say is capitalism is bad for our security and our safety. It deprives us from the right to develop ourselves freely and we need to deal with that. Uh, for us, security and safety means exactly that. It means be free and be able to make choices for our own life without being scared of anything and anyone. No system, no individual, no government. So um, there have been, you've heard about it as well, there have been other concepts of human security. There has been the very known concept of common security in the past, uh, in the 80s, you know, towards the end of the first previous Cold War, but all these systems never address, or all these concepts never address capitalism as a real problem. And this is something we are called to do. So um, if we want to be safe, we need to exit capitalism. We need to uproot it. Um, and just, um, uh, I want to quote somebody. Um, it's an, an academic, actually, uh, from the US, uh, Olufemi Taivo, that, that says that, we have to discuss openly in the left how to fundamentally reshape a social system that is centrally organized around securing profit, hierarchical prestige, 
physical safety of the few through the carcinal, so prisons, environmental green or non-green borders, desertification borders, and economic insecurity of the many. So this is pretty much um, the job that we have to do. And perhaps to shorten this intervention with something beautiful, um, I'd like to quote also Audrey Lord. As she told us many years ago, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle. So we do not have the privilege now to say, oh, I'm not interested in peace movements because I'm an environmental activist. I'm not interested in um, the peace movement because I'm anti-racist activist. Peace has to be and security the connecting topic of everyone and everything is at stake, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. I think that is really, really, really um, helpful to really draw out what, what lies at the heart of this paradox of security and insecurity. And that, of course, it is capitalism. And it is also, of, it is at least to me, and I hope to everyone who is listening in, um, it is very good to hear that your impression is that the movements and organizations that you have been working with in developing further the concept of security or developing one at all, that this is actually becoming more recognized. I hope that this was that this was the message that I got this right, that I understood you correctly, that you are actually um yeah, that you that there is this this despite the horrors of, of the current situation, that this is one of the consequences um that all these organizations recognize um recognize as Aubrey Lord said, that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle. Um, <clears throat> we want to talk a little bit more about about the about these paradoxes, or let's say how how we are being sold security. Because I think it is important for all of us to um, to understand how much that affects all of us. Because we cannot fall into this situation where we think, yes, but as long as I don't know, I'm not I'm not buying weapons. I'm not the person who works in the arms industry. I'm not. Um, like, where do we where do we interact in society? As uh, where, where do we interact with this concept, with this commodified concept of security? Where does that hit hit home for us? Um, so, in order again to, I think it is important to recognize that we can't avoid it. There's also the way that there's no single issue. There's also no way of saying, but I'm a peaceful person. This is like all not on me. Like I'm I'm doing my best. Um, so I think, Axel, if you could speak a little bit to what you have maybe found, again, I think probably in the workshops that you did with the, um, with the movements, with the organizations, um, how, this, how this commodified security that you can either buy or not buy, depending on where on the level of privilege you are, and how much you can also avoid it um, to, to, to be drawn into these conversations, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you, Franci. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, the the conclusion I think that we that we came to through our work is that we can see that yes, you said security is commodified, um, and security has become a, a tradable service, um, and thereby transforming um, a basic need or basic needs that we all have into um, a lucrative market, um, and and the profiteers of of this dominant security discourse, so the, the toxic um, national security-based uh, um, discourses that we're seeing at the moment, um, are those who are trading on the market, and that's mainly the actors of the security, military, industrial complex. And I mean, the, the, the core paradox that we're seeing is that those who create the instruments of repression and war, namely the uh, arms and security industries, um, are the very ones who are promising to reinstate security through their merchandise. And where we can see that um, playing out in, in the open, and as a practical example, we have Rheinmetall, which is a German arms company, and they're selling arms um, around the world, and these arms are used in conflicts and wars. Um, and these arms contribute um, to people uh, fleeing their homes and being displaced. At the same time, Rheinmetall, and we don't have to limit it to Rheinmetall, it, it also um, uh, comes to other um, companies uh, from, the, from the arms and uh, security industries. At the same time, they are selling um, technologies for border fortification, um, technologies um, 
that have the sole aim to make it harder for people um, to cross borders. Um, and we can also see that right now um, when we when we look at Frontex, and Frontex is a really striking example of how this security discourse, how this toxic security discourse um, pushed by the arms industry is is unfolding in form of an of an EU agency. Um, We've just uh, witnessed the resignation of uh, Fabrice uh, Legeri, the, uh, the head of Frontex, um, who is um, resigning um, not uh, because of the, the massive accusations that are there um, against Frontex, um, um, but for, for, structural, for structural reasons and for not being happy with his, um, his mandate anymore. Um, so this, this also shows the distorted understanding um, of, uh, of a man who was leading um, this agency um, and shows again the question of who is secure and, and whose security um, is is taken care of. Um, and I think looking at the example of arms corporations selling weapons and at the same time selling the materials and technology you need for border fortification shows also that the understanding of security um, that is uh, prevailing um, amongst governments right now is not um, there by accident. It is um, also a result of really hard lobby work um, of the security and arms industries for years. If you want to dive deeper into that, I can really recommend the reports by the Transnational Institute and the European Network Against Arms Trade, um, who are really focusing on and analyzing how the arms and security industries have been pushing um, for, for this understanding of security. And I think what we also have to take a look at is the, the process of secutar securitarization um, that also lies at the, at the heart of the problem that we see right now, which is basically um, turning a political problem into a security threat. And we can also see that um, playing out, and Kat already mentioned it, um, how um, governments and the EU um, are addressing um, migration and asylum. So asylum seekers and refugees are characterized as a security threat um, and thereby turning, turning a political problem that we have that means how do we approach uh, migration and asylum into a security issue um, that is then dealt with um, the answers that are provided by the military um, and security industries. So I think this this is also a phenomenon or, or a trend that we really have to question and turn around to not turn political problems that we have into security issues um, and addressing them from a, from a very different perspective. And I think that's what we're coming at um, uh, next, I guess, in the later questions. Yeah, indeed. I think like everything is very, like I'm unfolding in a very magical way. Um, we are totally connected on, on how to address the issue. And I think like now is the moment to talk about making this concrete. Um, I think we understood that capitalism produces the crisis and the violence that actually cannot solve after that. And then they use this concept of security, uh, filling it with who and for who uh, that the question, the answer is them uh, happens. So understanding this, this paradox, we have to unfold also our concept of security and fight this hegemony that Kat was talking on the beginning, that we need to push forward this discourse. And maybe this context is not very easy to do it, but it's very urgent to do it, right? So um, for us, shouldn't be peace also an abstract idea, not only security, right? We have to connect those. Uh, peace should be um, something that is not a naive thing, like, oh, I'm a, you know, I fight for peace, like a naive thing, but should be uh, a project, should be a strategy, um, as well as also a political practice that can only be international and collective, right? We need those spaces and those debates and those workshops that you have been doing have to be, you know, the process that we are all together pushing forward. So how do we make this new concept of security concrete? How can we explain it to people in this context? What are the shifts that we need to address uh, towards a security strategy that is demil demilitarized and human-centered cut? And then Axel. Yeah, thank you also for, uh, for this question, Nora. I mean, 
we've mentioned it before already, uh, right? When we were having our first uh, round talking about whether or not we feel secure or insecure today. We find ourselves now in a not secure and safe situation and sooner rather than later, if we also consider that the IPCC reports are rather optimistic, um, we will find our, uh, ourselves much sooner than, than later asking basic questions uh, on how we're going to secure ourselves and our basic needs. And I'm talking now very, um, uh, very, very much aware that I'm talking about Europe because there are other parts of the world where these basic needs are not served by any means, not now, and haven't been served um, for the for the last decades. So, um, as Axel uh, said, this main question: Who's every time, every time that a new security apparatus, a new security now all, always using brackets. Um, spending, uh, a new security plan or even a new security threat is being um, served to us by a media and those, those in power, we need, we need to ask this question. And this, is, this will be essential. Whose security are we talking about um, and whose safety? Who, and we need to ask this question in a sy systemic way. Like, what is actually served by the current, who is actually served by the current uh, power structures, whose security is more at risk, how this connects to con colonial continuities, and how does this connect to class struggles. A convincing and holistic approach of security derives from social struggles, derives from the needs of the people, and serves the needs for, of, for safety of all. This means we need to, to continue dialoguing on this and link questions of class, climate, migration, anti-racism, militarism, peace, uh, feminism. We need to link these questions. And we need, um, we need to link these questions not only when we're talking about peace and security, but we need uh, to get out of this logic of single uh, single issue struggles and 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 uh, collaborate uh, more collectively and also use this in our uh, analysis. To advance on this front, we need also a new language uh, and uh, language in terms of words and phrases and uh, theory but, and analysis, but we also need a new language in terms of uh, media, pictures, culture that talks about security and reclaim security for us. Um, it must not shy away this discussion from problems that we also face internally. I mean, we're all organized in our, in our left structures. Uh, left parties or left organizations are not exempt uh, from, uh, let's say, the, the power systems that govern our lives. We find sexism and racism in our own structures. We need to deal with it. Um, there are uh, discussions we will need to have that are going to get uncomfortable. Uh, especially uh, also for us here on the West that uh, have to uh, understand that we, we have to have, be willing to give up privilege, privilege in terms of material security as well. To counter this current um, hegemonic security poli uh, policies, the left needs to push for collective security approaches and to oppose um, these current policies and structures and expose the profiters of these current policies and, and, and structures, which means that now more than ever, the struggles that lie ahead of us uh, regarding inflation, wages, um, the fact that everything is becoming more expensive, housing, have, have, to, um, have to be very clear uh, in scandalizing the role that the security and in the military industrial complex actually has in our lives. We need to bring that topic into the table and push for it, which means and just to promote also our meeting um, in Madrid, which, which means we need to mob be, be bold. And although um, people mobilizing for peace right now are called whatever grotesque uh, you've heard of, of already, we need to say yes, because there is war, we need to fight for peace and, uh, and we need to do it now. And just to conclude, I mean, 
Collective security means arguing for a form of security that makes us safe because the others are also safe. It means uh, building down the antagonisms that seem natural within capitalism. Um, for example, the global distribution of COVID vaccines is illustrating uh, this with full force. Um, as long as the global inequality in, in, in vaccines still persists, this pandemic uh, will never end. No? So arguing from a collective security standpoint allows the left to counter the current antagonistic politics and structures with a viable and convincing alter alternative. Demanding safety in all aspects of life for all people is not utopian. It's rather very realistic and in absolute connection with our everyday material interdependence um, that is the, the, the planet we live on. So we have to go out, be bold and say nobody will be safe until everybody's safe. I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, connecting to that, um, I think uh, uh, Kat just nailed it uh, in the very end. So um, <laughs> we, could, we could call it a day here. Um, I think what we can what we can also um, draw inspiration from is is feminist approaches um, to security that have been there um, um, around for 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 a long time already. Um, I think it's important to also to not overlook in our work and our approaches um, the the concepts that are already uh, thought uh, through. Um, and, and I think looking at feminist approaches is really interesting. Um, also, when we're talking about um, war, as we're currently um, doing, um, to make sure that we are not focusing um, on, on state borders and state needs and interests, but on human rights and the basic needs uh, for a peaceful life. Um, and that means putting those most affected by war, the civilian population, into the middle of our discussions and into the heart of how we approach um, um, our, our conversations uh, about the war. Um, and I think this, um, as argued before, is, is, I think, a fundamental approach we have to take um, to look at the security of the many and look at individual security and getting away from state-centered um, national security that we've seen so far. Um, Kat, I already explained the concept of, of collective security. Um, I think it is right now very difficult to argue for collective security in, in the context of the war we're seeing. Um, and, and this is right now really challenging. I think um, it, is, it is really tricky at the moment. Um, but I think what we, what we shouldn't forget about when we, when we talk about um, collective security, um, also in the longer run, is that it applies and we can use um, the frame of collective security not only when we look at war and peace, but as Kat explained, also when we look at a pandemic and how a pandemic is unfolding. And we can also use the approach of collective security so we are safe when others are safe instead of our security against the security mm -hmm. of others. Um, when we look at um, care work, for example, and, and how our food is produced. Um, again, if we look at Europe, um, much of the care work and much of the uh, work in the agricultural sector um, is done um, by people who came to Europe and who are working under precarious conditions. And when we, when we look at it through the lens of uh, collective security, then we really have to argue for, uh, for humane and safe um, asylum and migration policy, and at the same time for fair working conditions in the care sector, in the agricultural sector. Um, because if those people who are providing our care, um, uh, the care for, for our relatives and at some point for us as well, and who are really crucial in um, in providing us um, with uh, with food as one of our basic needs. Um, if they are not safe, and if their material and physical security is not given, then we are not safe either. Those who are not working in these sectors. Um, so I think this is this is really a, a crucial aspect. Um, and I think getting away from antagonistic security. 
state-centered um, national security um, uh, focused debate into this collective security provides us with a language um, to address um, security as it has been or is difficult for the left um, to really address the issue. I mean, there, there is the saying that the more you talk about security, the more insecure people feel. But I think if we focus on, on discussions about collective security, um, we can get out of there and, and talk about a very different vision um, of living together in, in, in peace and safety. And I think, and, and Pat already mentioned it before, um, there are social movements who are struggling for exactly that. Um, and there are more and more social movements who see the interdependencies and who are, who are creating bonds um, and we're tackling um, tackling um, security issues they're face they're facing uh, together. Be it um, the climate crisis um, that we that we cannot um, address without addressing the military industrial complex. Um, be it that we cannot argue for for disarmament um, without arguing uh, for humane living conditions um, for refugees and those fleeing war. Um, and we cannot fight extra extractivism uh, without dismantling neocolonial power structures um, and so on. So these, these interdependencies are, are tackled by social movements. Um, and I think if we, if we look at how we're going to live um, in security in the future, very much um, depends on the ability of popular and social movements to challenge the current understanding of security and how um, how the security of the privileged few is secured compared to the security of the many, and I think this is, and I think this is also a bottom line of our work. I think this is what we can can and should really invest into into the struggle of social movements who are connecting their struggles and who are all affected by the security discourse and who are opposing it, um, and who are doing more and more so together. So I think this is the bottom line. Um, yeah, strengthening our struggles um, and getting up to it. Thank you. Thank you, Axel and Kat. I really, really want to thank you. We managed to go way over time, which just goes to show that we are not, I don't know, we're not done. We should be We should be talking a lot more about this. And I think that this concept of collective struggle, and you were just saying that it might be difficult to raise in the current uh, war-like uh, war-like situation, um, but I actually think the concept holds up. So it's actually showing, proving its point uh, in practice, absolutely. So I think, um, yeah, I think this is, some, this is something that needs to be discussed further. And I also 100% agree with Kat, and I hope that in June in Madrid, we can do this together to actually be bold and insist. It is not enough to just, you know, kindly knock on the doors and say, but we've got a different idea. No, we need to really, we need to really insist. And I think it has been proven that whatever, whatever this is, doesn't work. Capitalism isn't solving our crisis. So I want to, um, I want to thank you for coming uh, and joining us on the show. Um, I want to say to everyone else, if you miss any of the episodes or if you don't like to, if you don't like to listen to things, you can also read. We will produce articles. Uh, we produce articles out of these conversations. Um, so I think that's very, that can be useful. Um, we can paste the last one where we talk about the Yugoslav war, um, the war in Yugoslavia. Um, uh, we can paste it in the chat, the link to it. People's Dispatch publishes them. Um, thank you all. See you in uh, June in Madrid, where we will, and not only there, but until then, where we will fight capitalism and NATO, and we will continue our conversations. Thank you all. Thank See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.